Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to talk here today. Um, I'm from Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. I normally do these procedures with Dr. Mark McGuire, who doubles as an electrophysiologist. Um, we had planned for this all to be filmed by our audiovisual unit, but on the day they, for various reasons, they were unable to turn up. And so Dr. Dan Elder, who is our current registrar in the cath lab, acted as the photographer. Dr. Bruce Cartwright was the anaesthetist, and Dr. Fleur Rosenstraten, who's with us from the Netherlands, was manning the transesophageal echo. Uh, in assessing patients for percutaneous mitral valvotomy, I guess the first question is a clinical one, which I won't address. Does the patient need the intervention? It's like coronary disease. Just because you have it, you don't have to have an intervention. And then the important question is, will the patient be better served by mitral valvuloplasty or mitral valve replacement, which is the usual alternative? And that depends not only on the characteristics of the valve, which Lisa's has already touched on, but also importantly on patient characteristics. So, for example, during pregnancy, you would much rather perform a balloon mitral valvuloplasty, even if the result was not going to be super optimal, um, but you would like to avoid a mitral valve replacement in that situation. So it does depend on the patient as well what you decide to do. So this is a particular patient we're going to show. She was a... A uh, 40-something-year-old lady from New Caledonia, where quite a few of our patients have come, uh, with mitral stenosis that was of moderate severity. Uh, you can see that the leaflets are pretty mobile and there's not a lot of subvalvular disease. And also there's very little mitral regurgitation and she didn't have significant aortic valve disease. Um, this is a view that I take some notice of when planning balloon mitral valvuloplasty because you have to remember that you're going to... Uh, split the valve at the commissures here. Uh, and so the appearance of the commissures is quite important. And you'll notice here there's almost echo dropout at the commissures, so you know they're nice and thin, and this is a good valve for a balloon mitral valvuloplasty. If, on the other hand, you found both those commissures were calcified, even though the leaflet's thin and mobile, what you might end up doing is splitting a leaflet instead of splitting the commissures, even though the Wilpin score didn't seem too bad. So you do need to look at this view as well. And in a four-chamber view, you'll see the valve is quite mobile. There's not much subvalvular disease. And once again, in this pretty picture, there's not much mitral regurgitation. So this is a good valve for per per percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty. Now, I'm going to show you a series of videos, but it will help if I just tell you what the steps are. So we actually usually do this procedure under local anaesthetic and sedation, but as Dr. Selmeyer was away on a sabbatical holiday, we had access to the anaesthetist. And so we elected to do this procedure uh, under general anaesthesia, which has the advantage that you can uh, monitor things with transesophageal echocardiography, which is nice. You get access to the femoral artery and vein. Uh, we place a pigtail catheter in the aortic root as a marker for the transeptal puncture to be sure we don't puncture towards the aortic root. And we use that later to measure the left ventricular gradient. Um, you then proceed to an atrial septal puncture to gain access to the left atrium and you leave a guide wire in there or, or a sheath uh, so that you can then put the dilator and balloon in subsequently. So the next step is with a large 12 French dilator to dilate the femoral vein in the atrial septum. Uh, you take that out and then you pass the stretched balloon through the femoral vein up to the right atrium and across the atrial septum over the guide wire that's in the left atrium and take the guide wire out. The <coughs> balloon is then manipulated to the left ventricle. Sometimes this is fairly easy, sometimes it's not so easy. And if the, anterior, if the atrial septal puncture is too anterior, it can actually be quite hard or impossible. The distal part of the balloon is then inflated, and I'll show you that, and you pull the balloon back and this distal inflation fixes the balloon in the mitral valve and then you inflate the rest of the balloon. And after that, you assess the result. We do that primarily by echo. We used to measure lots of things by catheter, but we don't do that anymore. Maybe measure the gradient by uh, hemodynamics, but not outputs and things. Uh, and you may do the further dilatation. The balloon can be sized to different sizes, so you may start one size down if you're a bit concerned about the valve and then go up to full size, for example. Once you're happy with the result, you take the balloon out, and that's the end of the procedure. This is just to show the setup we have, where you can see we have fluoroscopy down on the bottom left, the transesophageal echo, which we're using in this case, is on the bottom right, and the hemodynamics on the top right. This um, balloon, I think, is the most clever piece of apparatus we use in interventional cardiology, and, uh, and I regret to inform you it was actually designed by a surgeon. I always hate to have to tell people that. Um, so the... Uh, 
the balloon itself is, is this device here. It's got this inner tube here. It's got de-airing vents and inflation vent. Uh, it's got a balloon stretching tube that goes through the, the, inner, um, the, the inner thing here uh, that you can stretch the balloon out. So that's the balloon not stretched. And then when you put this in, it stretches the balloon out, makes it about twice as long and sort of correspondingly half as wide, which is very useful for not leaving a big hole in the femoral vein or the atrial septum. Uh, it comes with this clever guide wire that has a very stiff shaft but a soft pigtail at the end. Uh, this dilator is actually a, a device for steering the balloon into the mitral valve, syringe for inflation, ruler and so forth. So this is just a little about the transeptal puncture. We like to bend the transeptal needle to give a greater bend than that which it comes with, which helps stop it slip up the atrial septum when you're trying to do the puncture and also keeps it away from the roof of the left atrium. So we've bent that a bit more than how it comes in the packet. And the white uh, thing on the table here is a combined sheath, uh, <coughs> combined sheath and dilator, and the needle is threaded up through that, uh, but not right out the end when it's put in the patient. So this is the actual transeptal puncture. So on the left is the fluoroscopy. Uh, obviously, we, on the right is the transesophageal echo, which we don't always have that, obviously, if we're doing it under local anesthesia. And you'll see this video is a little bit amateur, but I think you'll be able to see everything. So on the left, you'll see in a moment the needle go through the septum. Boom, it's gone through there. And we inject dye uh, in, into the left atrium to make sure we've actually gone there and not somewhere else. If you look on the right, this video should recycle in a minute. You can actually see it's nice with transesophageal echo. So, so now you can see the atrial septum tented by the dilator. In a moment, the needle will come out and then you'll see contrast in the left atrium because I'm injecting uh, radiographic contrast, but it appears as echo contrast in the left atrium so you know where you are. Uh, having established access to the left atrium, we then prepare the balloon, so we de-air it. And now Dr. McGuire is going to inflate the balloon. You'll see the distal part of the balloon will inflate first, down here. And then as you put the rest of the contrast in from the syringe, the rest of the balloon dilates. And then we measure using these calipers to make sure the uh, balloon is actually uh, inflated to the diameter it should be. There are markers on the syringe that, that you use, but we usually check that the markers do correspond to the extent of inflation that they're meant to. Um, <clears throat> the balloon is then stretched using the stretching rod, and just to show you the comparison, that's the balloon as it starts off. And, sorry. And when you stretch it, you can see it gets longer and thinner, which is clever. So this now shows that pigtail wire sitting in the left atrium. The, <clears throat> the pigtail catheter is sitting in the aorta and this 12 French dilator is being moved back and forth to dilate the atrial septum. Next, we introduce the stretched balloon, which you can see the radiographic image of, cross the atrial septum. And then as you cross the atrial septum, you remove the stretching device uh, so it becomes sort of floppy again and advance it across the wire, curling it up in the left atrium so as to try to avoid ending up in the atrial appendage. So you bring it right along down to the bottom of the wire there. Now we <coughs> uh, advance through the <coughs> inner tube, uh, this device that the company calls a stylet, but it's really a kind of steering handle. And uh, <coughs> in addition, we attach up the inflation syringe to the inflation port, which you'll see in a moment. Dr. McGuire has been careful not to attach it to the wrong one and to close the vent valve. And you'll see just the movements of the hands in a moment. So the stylet is meant to direct the balloon anteriorly towards the mitral valve. It's got a kind of bend on the end that does that, and it's fairly stiff. And the procedure consists in advancing the stilette and then moving the catheter, as you can see, over the stilette and repeating that sort of procedure to line it up with the valve and then are able to advance it into the left ventricle. So the balloon has now been advanced into the left ventricle. Um, 
it's sitting down a little bit, which we prefer. We prefer it sit straight towards the apex, and we usually pass it up and down. But it did seem to be free of the the cordy, uh, and as you'll see in a moment, the then then inflate the distal part of the balloon, pull it back into the valve there, and then inflate the rest. And then it, it actually often pops out like that. It's an indication you have actually expanded the valve, both the fact that the balloon is fully inflated and, and that it then pops back, the ventricle forces it back through the now dilated mitral valve into the left atrium. Uh, after that, we'll check the hemodynamics. In fact, in this patient, we did one more balloon inflation uh, and that was the end of the procedure. So that's basically how it all goes. Thank you.